A reading from 2 Timothy chapter 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me 
the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. A reading from St. John, chapter 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said again to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. delivered for our offenses. He was raised again for our justification. to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Our text is from John chapter 20. As I look at you this evening, my thoughts go back 33 years when I was sitting in those pews, probably thinking what you're thinking. Who is the guy in the pulpit? And more importantly, how long is he going to preach? <laughs> as a matter of fact, your faculty seemed pretty interested in that as well. I think about 15 of them asked me how long. <laughs> but it is an exciting day, and it is a humbling day, and it is the Lord's day. The risen Christ is present, and he is at work in, through, and around sinful human beings. And the crucified and risen Christ has chosen you for eternal life, and he has chosen you for pastoral ministry in the church. And all of us have been called to serve him. I tried to remember who it was 33 years ago who preached. I have no idea who it was or what he said. But it was some district president, so I'm sure it was profound and moving. <laughs> Dr. Jan Case was the placement director, and earlier in the day he met me out there and he said, Alan, after you get your call, I gotta talk to you because there's something unique about that call. That is not what you say to somebody about ready to get a call. <laughs> I am sure Dr. Pulse would never do anything like that to you guys, right? What I do remember also, standing in line and walking across the chancel, hearing my name, hearing the words St. Peter, and I thought, that's a nice name for a church. And then I didn't hear the town, but I heard Illinois. I'm from Wisconsin, I can live with Illinois. There were a few other places that I didn't want to go, and I won't tell you what they are, because they are represented by these district presidents. <laughs> they love their districts and their states, and I don't want to make any more enemies. <laughs> Speaking of my colleagues, your soon-to-be district presidents, these are fine and faithful men who serve the Lord in his church and his mission. They are we are as sinful as you are. And the blood of the land that covers you covers us too. You will find them as men who care about the church, the congregations, the schools, and the ministries they are responsible for. You will also find them very caring for pastors, workers of the church, and their families. They are trustworthy servants. And I assure you, they are your partners in the gospel. But it's not about the COP. It's not about the faculty. It's not about the congregations that are either represented here or watching live stream who are really excited about getting a new pastor. And it's not even about you, is it? It's about Jesus. It's about the risen Savior who has at work in you and through you and has called you. This Jesus shows up, and this Jesus speaks up. The Gospel reading, of course, comes from Resurrection Evening, and the disciples were behind closed doors, locked doors, for fear. They were in the midst of chaos and uncertainty, they were in the midst of fear and failure. They're locked in fear. Jesus had enemies and so did they. And I am sure they're wondering about their future. What will happen to them in their future if the enemies of Jesus get a hold of them? Come to think about it, what will your future be if the enemies of Jesus on this world get a hold of you? There is plenty of fear in the church these days. 
We'd all like to go back to the good old days, whenever they were, when the church was important and pastors were respected. Maybe we should hide too. Or maybe we should spend our ministry in anger or mistrust. At times it seems, doesn't it, that we are even afraid of the people that are in the room with us. We mistrust them. Not only fear, but failure. Every one of those disciples failed Jesus, including Peter. And we too have failed Jesus. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we've looked out for number one, and number one hasn't been Jesus, it's been us. We have sinned greatly and deserve nothing but God's wrath and punishment, and yet we think, God, I deserve better. You might even think, God, I deserve a better call. The disciples were a mess. And we make our own messes too, don't we? Without Jesus, we are a spiritual mess, our sinful heart. We make messes in our families, in our relationships. We even make messes in the church. If you stand in your righteousness, your success, your knowledge, your reputation, your wisdom, your position, you need not only fear the enemies of Jesus, but a just and holy God. You need better righteousness than that, and so do I. You and I, we need Jesus' blood and righteousness. Not only have we failed him in the past, but as pastors we fail him and we will fail him. We will fail the one who has set us apart and called us. Confess your sins regularly. Every pastor needs a pastor. And on occasion, you will have to stand in front of your congregation or maybe an individual in your congregation and say, I made a mistake. I sinned against you. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And some of the sweetest words I remember from parish ministry are, Pastor, we forgive you. Pastor, I forgive you. On that resurrection evening, Jesus shows up and he speaks up. How many times after his resurrection does Jesus say, peace be with you? He knew what they needed. He knew their fear. He knew their failures. He knew the chaos and he knew the uncertainty. Peace be with you and your families with the congregations that you are going and the people back home, peace be with you. Jesus did not abandon those disciples and Jesus, he will not abandon you. He shows his wounds. Peace is because Jesus is present and his work you know very well is his reconciling work that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting our sins against us. Jesus willingly shows his wounds for you. You probably have some wounds too. And if you don't, you'll have some. And by his wounds, you are healed. You are not locked in fear and you are not locked in failure. You are of Christ, and Christ is of God. And I would like to remind you, don't miss it in the text, that when those disciples heard the promise of Jesus, peace be with you, and when they saw the wounds of Jesus, they were overjoyed. They were glad. For Jesus had shown himself to them, and that same Jesus shows himself to you. You have very important work ahead of you. It's not going to be easy. You're going to be frustrated. But Jesus, he says, peace be with you, and may he give you gladness and that joy that he gives. Yes, we are joyfully Lutheran. And yes, we preach Christ crucified and risen. And the Jesus who shows up shows us how to show up. 
One of the great privileges of your ministry will be visitation. You will be in their homes. You will visit the homebound. You will go to the hospitals. You will be there in the midst of crisis and loss. And guess what? They're going to invite you to birthday parties, confirmations, graduations, anniversaries, funeral luncheons, and weddings. And by now you're saying, I can't go to everything. And you don't have to. But do visit. And do show up. And when you show up, listen up, listen closely, look them in the eyes. And it's amazing when you make those visits, you're at those places. It's not just about them, but it's about everybody else that finds out that pastors really aren't all that weird. <laughs> Laugh with them and cry with them. Jesus was sent. And you are being sent. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. The eternal Son of God comes down from heaven and he accomplishes the Father's sent mission perfectly. He pays for the sin of the whole world, even those who will never believe in him. Jesus was sent to take the punishment of your public sins. All of our public sins. And he paid the price for them. And Jesus was sent to pay for the sins your private sins as well. This is Jesus. This is your Jesus. And he is the perfect sent one. He was sent for the redemption of the world. And he says, behold, I am making all things new. While you are not exactly sent like the apostles, you are being sent out too. Jesus and his church are sending you out all around the country and maybe beyond. You are sent to places that you wouldn't choose. And probably in every other call you get, you are going to go where you are led because you serve Jesus and you follow Jesus. I would not have chosen my first call for me. But the Lord and the church made it easy. Alan? Here you go. Go. And it wasn't all that easy, and nor the second one, and this one isn't always easy either. But we do what the Lord and the church ask us to do. And he gives growth, and he gives humility and peace. A couple of years ago, while serving as district president, I visited one of our pastors in a nursing home, getting ready to go to be with our Lord. And as I walked in the door, he said to me, how's your job? Before, he could, before I could say anything, he said, wrong question. How's your calling? You have many callings. And the Lord is going to give you another calling. Remembering your calling as pastor, carry your cross, and follow Jesus and find comfort in the word and the wounds of Jesus for they are the wounds and the words of Jesus who has called you and he is your crucified and risen Lord I don't know if you heard it I'm sure you did that reading from 2nd Timothy Paul makes it very clear what our charges preach the word. Preach the word. Beware of all kinds of distractions. You're going to even face good distractions, things that are really good, but they're not the best. And sometimes even those distractions, they get in the way of preaching the word and its truth and purity, its purpose and power. Preach the word. Beware of the distractions. And then this text, we know that the Apostle Paul is very concerned about false teachings and heresy. But I find it very interesting that in this text, as he ends it, he says, endure suffering and do the work of an evangelist. Be a gospel proclaimer. Proclaim the gospel and its truth and purity to the people that God has gathered in your congregation. Be a gospel proclaimer. 
And you are going to have opportunities in the communities the Lord puts you to also be a gospel proclaimer. Do the work of an evangelist. I truly believe that the Apostle Paul wants Timothy to have that same missionary zeal that Jesus had given to him. Paul knew what it was to live in spiritual darkness and to be hellbound. And the risen Christ met him on the road to Damascus and gave him life and eternal life. And he wants Timothy to have that very same passion, that mission heart. The heart of Jesus is the mission of Jesus for those inside the church and those outside the church. Like Jesus and Paul and Timothy, we meet people and they're as confused and messy as we can be. And the last thing is interesting, by the way, you're on the offense. Preach the word, you're on the offense. Preach the word, you're, do the work of an evangelist, you're on the offense. Fulfill your ministry, you're on the offense. Do the work that you've been called to do. Do the work that the Lord and the church have called you to do. Your work is in the congregation, and your work, this ministry, is also in your community. I know this, that when I came out of the seminary, I thought I needed to fix everything. Maybe I had a little bit of a savior complex. The good thing is, I'm not the savior. You're not the savior. Those guys even aren't the savior. We have one savior. And he will take care of you and he will take care of his church and there still remains power in the gospel beyond the offense. And Jesus, who was set apart from eternity, sets you apart. Receive the Holy Spirit. The Lord is still giving that Holy Spirit to his church and to his people. Receive that Holy Spirit with anticipation and joy. Your ministry, your life, your calling as a Christian and your calling as a pastor is spirit-filled and spirit-led and there is a perpetual union between the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Receive the Spirit and rely on that Spirit. And you, by the command of Jesus, Jesus gives authority to his pastors and his church to forgive sins and withhold forgiveness. There is great joy when sins are forgiven, and that is the goal, the forgiveness of sins. And there is a burden for the pastor and the congregation when sins are not repented of and they are not forgiven. God is making his appeal through you. Be reconciled to God, and that starts with us. God is making his appeal through us. Through us. One of my most memorable ministry moments was after church. I was standing at the back door, my final parish, you know where you shake hands, get a hug, or a high five? I'm not even sure what the sermon was about, but somebody stopped the line and held my arms and said, Pastor, everything you said that was for us today is for you too. Everything you said was for us is for you too. It's for you too, and you too. Your partners in the gospel are the Council of Presidents and the faculty of this seminary. Your partners in the gospel are the pastors that you will serve within your circuit and district and the synod. They are your partners in the gospel. Your partners in the gospel will be commissioned workers, teachers and deaconesses and musicians and DCEs. And your partners in the gospel will be the lay men and lay women of the church who love their Lord, want to love their pastor, and they want more people to know about Jesus.
Well, sometimes your job is going to be frustrating, but your labor is not in vain. Sometimes our jobs are disappointing, but our labor is not in vain. Sometimes the church, when it faces all kinds of opposition and hostility, the church needs to remember too. The church needs to remember that our labor is not in vain because, because Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Greetings, in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. First, let me say thank you to President Buss. I will say that I don't have any clue who preached or what they said 38 years ago. But you know, I never forgot that congregation. I can tell you every detail. And I'm sure I won't forget anything you said either. Those are great words of wisdom and encouragement for our gentleman here going out into the harvest field thank you well i like projects now some would argue that my wife likes them more than me me being her chief and ongoing project least I can say I'm the greatest. But I do like projects and my most current project is the construction of a speakeasy in my basement. I'm building what my mother calls an illegal bar. And I'm doing it from a pile of uh, old and reclaimed lumber that has come into my possession, all shapes and sizes, dimensions. So I'm trying to piece it all together. With no blueprints, no available plans or anything. Perhaps you can see where this is going. <laughs> well, during this building process, I have often run up against difficulties and challenges, obstacles that stump me. How will this work? How do I make that fit? I go to bed at night with this conundrum and I wake up at 3 a.m. in a sweat and I know the answer. As my friend Dr. David Scare would say, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. All shapes and sizes, bits and pieces, odds and ends. All of you, all of us. The Lord has provided his church with 137 calls for candidates. And he has provided 86 candidates for all of these calls all shapes and sizes of calls and all manner of odds and ends of candidates <laughs> and at three in the morning I wake up in a sweat but the Lord remains the Lord of the church and the Holy Spirit still moves and speaks according to his means and all the shapes and sizes come together fit together with the odds and the ends. And so we have come to this, this joy-filled day. Joy-filled because all the candidates from your seminary who have been prepared for the office of the Holy Ministry will receive a call. Now, placement process always has its challenges, and this year, no exception. 
and it requires the work of the entire church. So my thanks to all of our district presidents and their staffs, to congregations and call committees, circuit visitors and pastors, the Council of Presidents, the placement people at Concordia St. Louis. Together, as the church, we've managed to carry out the call process while safely guarding the integrity of the call. Again, by the grace of God and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I have to give a special note of thanks also to Dr. Todd Peppercorn, the junior varsity in charge of Vicarage, <laughs> and my excellent staff, Nancy Raber and Lorinda Motter. Also a big thanks to Robin Ombrust at the Synodical Office and thanks to the Placement Committee led by President Dwayne Lewick and my counterpart at Concordia St. Louis, Dr. Glenn Nielsen, been a privilege working together again this year for the sake of the church. So this year there are 30 MDiv candidates and one alternate route candidate from our seminary for a total of 31, and 31 MDiv, three alternate route, combined with seven SMP, four colloquy, six EIIT, two CMC, and one Center for Hispanic Studies, plus one candidate from St. Catharines in Canada for a total of 86 candidates, 66 MDiv and AR. There were 137 calls available for use and 83 calls extended. That leaves 54 calls unfilled. More than last year, perhaps the most ever. Please give your prayers for these congregations not receiving candidates at this time and pray to the Lord of the Harvest to send workers. Would the candidates now please present themselves? <laughs> Nicholas R. Belcher, Associate Pastor St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church, Topeka, Kansas, Kansas District. Joshua A. Benish, Church Planter, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, South Wisconsin District, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Micah J. Brooks, pastor, St. Luke Lutheran Church, Nunaka, Michigan, Michigan District. Gunner G. Campbell, Campbell pastor, Christ Lutheran Church, Jacob, Illinois, Southern Illinois District. Matthew G. Carlson, pastor, Our Savior Lutheran Church, Joliet, Illinois, Northern Illinois District. Raymond B. Cox, pastor, Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd, Biloxi, Mississippi, Southern District. (laughs) 
Brennan T. DeForest, Pastor, Redeemer Evangelical Lutheran Church, Chico, California, California, Nevada, Hawaii District. Joshua P. Dub, Pastor, St. John Evangelical Lutheran Church, Peru, Indiana, Indiana District. Nicholas C. Gapsky. Associate Pastor, St. Stephen Lutheran Church, Detroit, Michigan, and Family of God Lutheran Church, Detroit, Michigan, Michigan District. <coughs> Mark P. Gassler, Pastor, Emmanuel Lutheran Church, Lynn, Kansas, Kansas District. Thomas E. Goodroad, Associate Pastor, Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, Lincoln, Nebraska, Nebraska District. Jeremy C. Hansen, Associate Pastor, Bethlehem Evangelical Lutheran Church, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, South Wisconsin District. James A. Haugen III, Pastor, St. John Evangelical Lutheran Church, Holgate, Ohio, Ohio District. Benjamin N. Jansen, Associate Pastor, Holy Cross Evangelical Lutheran Chapel, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, English District. Anthony M. Kilani, Pastor, Redeemer Lutheran Church, Sydney, Ohio, Ohio District. Zachary T. Klump, Pastor, Gloria Day Lutheran Church, Virginia, Minnesota, and Redeemer Lutheran Church, Aurora, Minnesota, Minnesota North District. Dale R. Cranky, Pastor, Redeemer Lutheran Church, Austin Town, Ohio, Ohio District. Jonah Q. Laws, Pastor, Faith Lutheran Church, Rogue River, Oregon, Northwest District.
Blake J. Martzowska, pastor, Christ Lutheran Church, Mantua, Ohio, and St. Thomas Lutheran Church, Streetsboro, Ohio, Ohio District, and English District. Jeremy T. McDonald, pastor, Zion Lutheran Church, Ulm, Arkansas, and Our Savior Lutheran Church, Brinkley, Rich, Arkansas, Mid-South District. Dakota S. Monday, pastor, St. Paul Lutheran Church, Whispering Pines, North Carolina, Southeastern District. Paul D. Norris, pastor, St. Matthew's Lutheran Church, Delphi, Indiana, Indiana District. Brian J. Nygaard, Pastor, Trinity Memorial Lutheran Church, Merrillville, Indiana, Indiana District. Brian D. Payne, missionary, Board for International Mission, probably Tanzania, <laughs> St. Louis, Missouri, Missouri District. Carl R. Petzl, pastor, St. John Lutheran Church, West Branch, Michigan, and Hope Lutheran Church, St. Helen, Michigan, Michigan District. Charles Vincent Shemwell, pastor, Bethlehem Lutheran Church, Johnson City, Tennessee, Mid-South District. Ellery J. Stephenson, pastor, St. John's Lutheran Church, Kimball, Nebraska, and Emmanuel Lutheran Church, Burns, Wyoming, Wyoming District. Joel Peter Wagner, pastor, St. Paul's Lutheran Church, Latimer, Iowa, Iowa District East. Daniel E. Warner, Pastor, Zion Lutheran Church, Gordonville, Missouri, and St. Paul Lutheran Church, Chaffee, Missouri, Missouri District.
David C. Wellner, pastor, Grace Lutheran Church, Smithville, Texas, Texas District. Mark G. Zeroth, Associate Pastor, Our Redeemer Lutheran Church, Dubuque, Iowa, and St. Matthew Lutheran Church, Sherrill, Iowa, Iowa District East. President Rapp. The pastors elect, please rise and hear the charge from your Lord. Go then, take heed unto thyself and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made thee overseer, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Feed the flock of Christ, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being Lord over God's heritage, but being an ensample to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, thou shalt receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. The Lord bless thee from on high, and make thee a blessing unto many, that thou mayest bring forth fruit, and that thy fruit may remain unto eternal life. Amen. Amen.
be with you. And with my spirit. Let us pray. O oh God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord God, merciful and gracious Father, we give thanks for all the blessings you have bestowed on these, your servants, in their preparation for the holy ministry. By your Holy Spirit, grant them readiness and steadfastness in their ministry, patience, understanding, a cheerful spirit, and great zeal. Support and strengthen them that by your word your church may be built and increased through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Direct us, O Lord, and in all our doings with your most gracious favor, and further us with your continual help that in all our works begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name and finally by your mercy obtain eternal salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. What a wonderful evening and what a great time of celebration to gather together and to see the Lord keep his promise to his church, to send laborers into the field because the fields are ripe for harvest. We're so delighted that you're here with us this evening and we're so delighted with those who are joining via live stream, some of whom have just seen their new pastor for the first time. We are also delighted to welcome the Council of Presidents here to the seminary. They've enlivened our time together over the last several days as they've been meeting. And at this point, I'd like to invite their chairman, Dr. Lee Hagan, forward to offer a few words. Dear saints of God, it is a joy to welcome new graduates, soon to be, new pastors into the ministerium of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. As President Rast said, you are indeed an answer to the prayers of God's people, congregations all over the country who've been praying for this night. And they rejoice and give thanks to God that the Lord has provided for them through you, and it is our prayer that the Lord would richly and abundantly bless your ministry to the congregations that you will soon be going to. I'd like to give you these words of encouragement. In his 20th evening lecture on the proper distinction between law and gospel, 
Dr. C.F.W. Walther wrote this. When a place has been assigned to a Lutheran candidate of theology where he is to discharge the office of a Lutheran minister, that place ought to be to him the dearest, most beautiful, and most precious spot on earth. He should be unwilling to exchange it for a kingdom, whether it is in a metropolis or in a small town, on a bleak prairie or in a clearing in the forest, in a flourishing settlement or in a desert. To him, it should be a miniature paradise. Do not the blessed angels descend from heaven with great joy whenever the Father in heaven sends them to minister to those who are to be heirs of salvation? Why then should we poor sinners be unwilling to hurry after them with great joy to any place where we can lead other men, our fellow sinners, to salvation? In a few moments you will tear into those packets you will begin reading. Our prayer is that you look upon these first calls as Dr. Walter did. It is a joy and a privilege to welcome you to the ministerium. We pray that God would grant you great joy as you serve. And I leave you with these words. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord... Your labor is not in vain. God bless you all. <clears throat> Thank you, President Hagen. And now, the president of our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, Dr. Matthew Harrison. I've got a few things on my mind. <laughs> but... Really, I couldn't add anything that your great teachers have not already taught you, your vicarages, the Lord's blessed word. You're soon coming to the second most solemn point in your life where you will be ordained into the office of the ministry in the context of a congregation confessing your life and death commitment to the Holy Scriptures and the Lutheran Confessions. We're proud of you. We love you. We're happy for you. We're happy with you. We thank God for you and your families and your spouses and your children. And I simply say, considered according to geographic breadth, theological commitment, and sheer numbers, despite all of our many weaknesses, Welcome to the greatest Lutheran ministerium on the earth. God grant you peace and joy in his name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. After that, no more need be said. So I have a few words. <laughs> First of all, thanks to my dear brother in Christ, Alan Buss, for delivering the gospel to us tonight and focusing us on the service to which Christ calls us and pointing us to the world outside that so needs to hear of our Lord Christ. It is a delight to welcome a classmate to deliver such a sermon. And I looked around the room, not during the sermon, and counted several other of my classmates, not only Pastor Buss, but Pastor Hill, and Pastor Saunders, and Pastor Sp Spittel, and Pastor Welmer, and Pastor Zeroth, all from the class of 1990. 33 years ago, they sat in those spots you're sitting in right now and heard a preacher that none of us remember. <laughs> And Al's right, none of us remember what he said, whoever it was. But I'm sure it was profound and moving. I'm quoting him. 33 years, but I didn't sit with them. 
I sat farther back because I was staying for a Master of Sacred Theology degree, an STM, which they all said meant scared to minister. <laughs> but I did sit with President Harrison, so just keep that in mind as well. And we were going on for extended studies. The point being in all of this, what the Lord is, has done for you men is for, he has forged relationships beginning here that you will carry into your service even 33 years down the path. And the work that you've done together that sometimes has been difficult has been lived in the midst of disruption and difficulty at times. He reconciles and uses each of us in his way, in his time, according to his purpose, for the sake of the proclamation of the gospel. And 33 years from now, when one of you is standing here, one of you is sitting over there, and one of you is sitting here, just remember that I said it, not Harrison. <laughs> in all seriousness. You see how the Lord works. He keeps his promises. He says, I will give shepherds to my church, and he does. And he gives them to young men in 1990 and to men in 2023, and he ensures that the gospel continues to be proclaimed in every place, including Tanzania, one of my favorite places in the world. So thank you, Al, for your sermon. Thank you, brothers, for our work together, which is just beginning. And thank you to the families who have supported these men in this long pathway and even longer service as we prepare to send them out to serve our Lord. We will have some wonderful opportunities to gather together following the service. Please move directly to the quad as you rejoice and spend time together. We'll have cookies and punch served by our incredible guild in the dining hall because it's freezing in Indiana on <laughs> April 25th. But the joy that warms our hearts, which is the gospel of our Lord, drives all that away. So thank you again for being here. Rejoice and rejoice loudly indeed, for Christ is risen, hallelujah. Yeah.